Good morning. Thank you, Margita. I'm sitting here saying, you know, there's no instrument like the organ to give a rich, full feel of God's presence. I really love that. So thank you for sharing that with us this morning. We hope you're doing well. Everybody feeling good? Good. Smiling? Have you smiled to anybody and everybody so far this morning? Go ahead. Give some more smiles. Let's give some more smiles. You can never get enough smiles. Well, we welcome you to the service this morning. 
Um, looks like a little gloominess out there, but remember, the sun is always... Yes, it is. Praise his name for that. Uh, do remember that there will be the Cinco de Mayo uh, buffet <laughs> right after the service downstairs, so um, I hope you didn't have breakfast so you're all ready to go. Uh, so we'll enjoy that as well. Our call to worship this morning reminds us of our Creator and our God. So we ask God that as we worship you today that you will give ear to our words, that you'll consider our meditations. We'll hearken unto the voice, hear our cry, O Lord our King, for unto you will we pray. But as for me, we will come into the house in the multitude of your mercy, and in thy fear will we worship you in your holy temple. But let all those that put their trust in God rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy because you defend us. Let us also love your name and be joyful in thee. For you, God, are blessed, are righteous, and you show favor to those that you love. So we worship God in the beauty of his holiness and of his mercy today. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that you have given us the opportunity to worship you today. We thank you that you have given us the opportunity to lift up our prayers, to lift up our songs of praise, and to know that you are listening, and to know that you are present. So be with us through your Holy Spirit today. Encourage our hearts, and may we know and feel the presence of you as we worship you this morning. So bless every aspect of this service. Bless each person in attendance. Bless those who are online with us as well. And may we know that we have been in the presence of God. We pray these things in the name of the one who has taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We invite you to stand as we sing our opening hymn, All Things Bright and Beautiful. The words will be on the screen. How are you today? Good. And this is a fine young man, strapping young man, respectful young man. Now, do you ever have questions that you ask of your parents or grandma? A lot. 
A lot, okay, good. Do you ever have any request? Would you please do this for me or do that for me? You do that. Now, here's a big question. Have you ever told your parents or grandma what to do? No. Well, that is interesting. Have you ever made suggestions of what to do? Yeah. Yes, you have. Helpful criticism. Well done, Lucas. You have just expressed what God wants us to do always. Pray. When we ask God for things, when we suggest things to God, when we make requests of God, and even when we tell him how we really feel, if we want to call it helpful criticism, God loves that. Because God knows when we communicate with him, we are in a relationship with him. And that's what prayer should be. Prayer is like talking to God as he's your friend. Yes, we're still respectful. We know he has all power. He can do anything he wants. But we need to remind him how we feel so we can share our thoughts with him. So that when things happen, we know it's because we are in relationship with God. So that's what prayer is. Praying, asking God. Praying, telling God. Praying, saying to God, you know, God, I don't feel so well today. Somebody did this to me and I'm not feeling too good about that. God wants to hear all of that. And he listens and he cares and he'll do what he can to make you feel better. That's what God does. So remember to pray always. Thessalonians says, pray without ceasing, meaning every moment of the day be praying. How does that happen? So you're getting ready for an exam? Pray, God help me do well on this exam. When the exam is done, God, thank you. I know you were with me. I feel really good about that exam. Or if somebody, as I said before, says something to you that doesn't feel good, God help me to feel better. Help me to know that you made me, I am special. So no matter what anybody else says, I can be in you and be happy in you. So that's what we need to do is to keep praying and asking God to bless us. Let us pray, Lucas. Father, we thank you that you love us so, that you allow us the opportunity to share our hearts, feelings, thoughts, questions with you, and you listen and answer. So we pray that you'll continue to bless Lucas as he continues to grow in you, as he continues to spend time in prayer with you, that you will continue to make him the young man that you want him to be and the young Christian that you want him to be. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, The story is told of three ministers. One was a priest, one was a rabbi, and one was, we'll call him a minister. They had different discussions of what to do with offerings. So one says, well, I draw a circle on the ground, I throw my money up in the air, Whatever lands in the circle, that's God's. The other guy said, oh, that's interesting. I do something similar. I do a sliver on the ground. I throw my money up in the air. Whatever lands in that sliver is God's, and I keep the rest. The rabbi got a little irate with these men. He says, I don't understand you guys how you act that way with God. What I do. I throw my money up in the air, whatever God wants, he keeps. <laughs> I wonder if that's what we do with our offerings. Our offerings are for God, he asks so little of us in return for his blessings. So we always want to return what he asks for, give offerings to bless the church and what is going on in the ministries of the church. So do remember that there are baskets at the back that you may leave your tithe and offerings as you come to the service each day. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your blessings to us. We thank you for the offerings that have been returned, whether they be here or online, in whatever fashion. Bless the givers. Bless those who may not have to give but want to. But let us know, Father, that when we trust you, you take care of us. So bless the offerings we ask. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
morning's reading is Psalm 55. Give ear to my prayer, O God, and hide not thyself from my supplication. Attend unto me, and hear from me. I mourn in my complaint, and make a noise. Because of the voice of the enemy, because of the oppression of the wicked, for they cast iniquity upon me, and in wrath they hate me. My heart is sore pained within me, and the terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fearfulness and trembling are come upon me, and horror hath overwhelmed me. And I said, O oh, that I had wings like a dove, for then I would fly away and be at rest. Lo, then would I wander off and remain in the wilderness, Selah. I would hasten my escape from the windy storm and tempest. Destroy, O Lord, and divide their tongues, for I have seen violence and strife in the city. Day and night they go about it upon the walls thereof. Mischief also, and sorrow in the midst of it. Wickedness is in the midst thereof. Deceit and guile depart not from her streets. For it was not an enemy that reproached me. Then I could have borne it. Neither was it he that hated me that did magnify himself against me. Then I would have hid myself from him. But it was thou, a man mine equal, my guide and mine acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together and walked into the house of God in company. Let death seize upon them, and let them go down quick into hell, for wickedness is in their dwellings and among them. As for me, I will call upon God, and the Lord shall save me. Evening and morning and at noon I will pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. He hath delivered my soul in peace from the battle that was against me, for there were many with me. God shall hear and afflict them, even he that abideth of old, Salah. Because they have no changes, therefore they fear not God. He hath put forth his hands against such as be at peace with him. He hath broken his covenant. The words of his mouth were smoother than butter, but war was in his heart. His words softer than oil, yet they were drawn swords. Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. But thou, O God, shall bring them down into the pit of destruction. Bloody and deceitful men shall not live out half their days but I will trust in thee. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. Last Thursday, <clears throat> excuse me, last Thursday, what was it? Anybody know? What day was it? May the 4th. I love smart people. Yes, May the 4th. Thank you. Anybody else know? It was a national day of? No. It was, no, well, maybe it was, I don't know, but it was a National Day of Prayer. National Day of Prayer. So guess what we're going to talk about today? Hmm. <laughs> we're going to talk about a national day now. We're going to talk about prayer. And it is amazing to me, uh, you, you read the Psalms, many of them are prayers. Many of them are prayers that David prayed and others prayed to God. And sometimes they sound so downtrodden, but they were sharing their heart with God and he was listening. Today we're going to talk about a prayer that most of us know. But we want to look a little deeper into it. Our sermon title today is, Whose Prayer Is It Anyway? You have any idea what we're talking about today? There are some famous verses in the Bible that people know. They may not know where they are found. So if I showed you this verse, do you know what verse this is? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. One of the most famous verses in the Bible. Sometimes we forget what goes on in the second part of that, verse 17, for God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. We sometimes forget that God sent his Son to save us, not to condemn us. There's another famous verse in the Bible, or verses in the Bible, and let me know, tell me where are these verses found? Anybody have an idea? Mm 
And anybody say in the Bible? That will be a good answer. <laughs> Matthew 6. There you have it. Okay? In case you were wondering if I was trying to trick you. You're right there. So we're going to look at the Lord's Prayer today. But that's why I'm asking the question, whose prayer is it anyway? He's teaching us how to pray this prayer. So maybe it's our prayer, not the Lord's Prayer. But let's look at it. We're going to break it down and look at different parts of it to see what God was trying to teach his disciples and us, ultimately. He starts off the prayer with, oh, there it is. <laughs> Our Father, who art in heaven. What does it mean to have a father? In our world today, there are some absentee fathers. There are deadbeat fathers, so depending on what your father was like, you have an idea or think God is like your dad was here on earth. If you had the perfect dad, then you understand God completely. But as human beings, none of us, I believe, have had the perfect dad. We may have had some very good dads, fathers. So when we think of God, our father, he's saying, consider him as your dad. You are his child. He wants what is best for you. So when you say our father, most fathers aren't trying to kill you. Unless you really did something horrible. I jokingly say my dad would grab whatever he could to beat us with. He wasn't trying to kill us. He just wanted to get his point across. <laughs> anyway, it's another story altogether. I'm bringing on sweat just thinking about it. Anyway, so the fact is, our father isn't out to get us. He's out to help us. He's out to bless us. James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Our Father in heaven never changes. He offers his gifts to us all. He tells us that he allows the rain and the sun to fall and shine on the good and on the evil. That's who our God is. And he is in heaven. He's in that place where he wants us to live with him forever. So our Father, he's in the right place to look after us and take care of us. Hallowed be thy name. Okay, where do we start? Have you ever heard somebody use God's name in vain? Exodus 27 says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Find something else to say when you're angry than calling God's name. It would be an amazing thing. Next time you're angry or a friend says something, this is what I've said to some people. When they say, call God's name, it says, oh, are you praying to him now? They look at me like I'm crazy. We need to remember his name is holy. Even the angels bow in deference when they say his name. So we want to make sure that his name is not used flippantly, in anger, cussing at other people. That's taking his, vein, his name in vain and using it inappropriately. Sometimes if I make a mistake, I call a name in vain. I must admit, I say, oh, Wendell. That's a name I take in vain when I make a mistake. Maybe let's try that. Call your own name when you're angry and see how you feel <laughs> about that. Hallowed be thy name. Holy is your name. I will use your name only as in respect and love for you. Can you imagine at the coronation yesterday if somebody just said, Ah, oh, King Charles, ah, oh, King Charles, King Charles, King Charles. They would dare not do that. <laughs> because they respected what was going on and they didn't want to use his name in vain. Thy kingdom come. To me this is a very amazing verse because what we have to understand is what is the kingdom that is speaking about? What is the kingdom that is talking about? 
The Bible says, until the time of John, all the prophets and the law of Moses spoke about the kingdom. Oh, sorry. <laughs> spoke about the kingdom. That means from the beginning, they were talking about the kingdom. What is this kingdom that they're talking about? Then Jesus says, go and preach. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. So it talks about the prophets from the Old Testament on, preaching about the kingdom. Jesus says, go and preach that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And from the time John preached his message, until the very day the kingdom of heaven has suffered violent attacks. So meaning that the kingdom of heaven was already there when Jesus was there. The kingdom of heaven was already there when John the Baptist was preaching. The kingdom of heaven was already there even in the Old Testament because it suffered violent attacks on those who strived to seize it. So what is this kingdom of heaven? Let's go on. No, it is not Beelzebub, but God's Spirit who gives me the power to drive out demons, which proves that the kingdom of God has already come upon you. So people accuse God of casting out demons through the devil. <laughs> and God says, no, it's not the devil that gives me this power. This comes from the God of heaven, which tells you that the kingdom is already here, already present. Then Jesus said to his disciples and to Peter especially, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What you prohibit on earth will be prohibited in heaven. And what you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. So God is saying we have the ability to invite people into the kingdom of heaven. Really? That is interesting. So then still the question in my mind is, what is the kingdom of heaven? You know there are many parables that talk about the kingdom. There's a parable of the sower, the net, the pearl of great price, the hidden treasure. I may do a series on the parables because they're amazing teachings, lessons for us, tools for us to learn. But maybe, I believe, if we look through the scripture, the kingdom of heaven is the good news. The kingdom of heaven is the gospel. The kingdom of heaven is eternal life. The kingdom is anyone who accepts the good news and lives in it. So we are in the kingdom of God today. Now we're saying, wait, wait, but I thought that was future. No, the kingdom is now. If we live and practice as we are in the kingdom now, then heaven won't be that difficult to do. But I promise you, if you don't practice living in the kingdom now, it's going to be difficult to make it there. Because God wants us to have a relationship with him now to be in the kingdom now, to be living as kingdom keepers now. So when we say, thy kingdom come, we're saying, God, live out your life in me. Let your kingdom reside in me now. May I live as though I am already in your kingdom. Then it says, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We know in heaven that whatever God asks, the angels do. We know that in heaven, the angels obey him. We know that in heaven, what he says goes. Daniel says, he looks on the people of the earth as nothing. Angels in heaven and people on earth are under his control. No one can oppose his will or question what he does. We have no ability to question God. Understand this term. When God does something, we can ask him why, but we can't question him. That make a difference. Your child, when you tell them to do something, they can say, well, you know, I, but they'll say, who do you think you are? You're not my mom. There's a difference between asking a question and questioning someone. Even Jesus himself, 
he went a little farther on threw himself face downward on the ground and prayed my father if it is possible take this cup of suffering from me yet not what I want yet not my will but your will be done what you want must be done once more Jesus went away and prayed my father if this cup of suffering cannot be taken away unless I drink it your will be done when we say to God your will be done we're saying God do whatever you need to do and I'll be alright with that do whatever you need to do to save me and I'll be alright with that I know I mentioned it before that has been my prayer for years decades and I tell you what God will answer that prayer you may not like how he answers that prayer but he will answer that prayer because ultimately his goal is to save us ultimately that is his goal in order to be set, to set us free from the present evil age Christ gave himself for our sins in obedience to the will of our God and Father if Jesus was not willing to follow the will of God and to be in the will of God we would be lost so we ask God your will be done do what you need to do because I want to be in your will I want to be saved in your kingdom I want to be your child so your will be done in my life as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread what is a bread I know it's easy to think it just means food but I'd like to suggest that it's more than just food you cannot be a slave of two masters you will hate one and love the other you will be loyal to one and despise the other you cannot serve both God and money this is why I tell you do not be worried about the food and drink you need in order to stay alive or about clothes for your body after all isn't life worth more than food and isn't the body worth more than the clothes he is telling us when we say give us this day our daily bread we're saying God I trust you to supply my needs I am not going to try and do all this on my own thinking I know what's better for me I'm going to trust you to supply my needs therefore God if I am working at a job that I know morally is doing things that aren't right I'm going to ask to leave I'm going to trust you to take care of my needs it's not just about the food we eat but it's our home where we live our car that we drive and we're saying nothing is more important to me father than your will and your experience so give me today just what I need and prepare me today for what I need almost you can add in that prayer God would you also today lead someone to me that I can witness to put someone in my path so that I can share your love and goodness with give us today our daily bread Jesus reminds them look at the birds they do not plant seeds gather a harvest and put it in barns yet your father in heaven takes care of them aren't you worth much more than birds can any of you live a bit longer by worrying about it and why worry about clothes look how the wildflowers grow they do not work for or make clothes for themselves God provides for them so he says don't worry about today because you've already said give us today what we need so I'm not going to worry about tomorrow next week 40 years from now. now I'm not saying don't plan I'm not saying if you're working still not to put something aside for retirement that's not what I'm saying but don't be so worried that more you think about the more you think about is your stuff than the God of your stuff the God who gives you everything that you have so don't worry about that 
But I tell you that not even King Solomon with all his wealth had clothes as beautiful as one of these flowers. It is God who clothes the wild grass, grass that is here today and gone tomorrow, burned up in the oven. Won't he be all that more sure to clothe you? What little faith you have. Instead, be concerned about everything else with the kingdom of God and with what he requires of you, and he will provide you with all these other things. So do not worry about tomorrow. It will have enough worries of its own. There is no need to add to the trouble each day brings. So don't take on tomorrow what's going to happen, because there's enough going on for today. So I'd like to say when we ask God to give us this day our daily bread, we're also saying, God, give me more faith today. Give me the ability to trust you more today. Give me the ability to believe in your word, to believe in who you are today. Because when we do that today, when tomorrow becomes today, we'll do it today again. When next week becomes today, we'll do it today again. So give us today what we need to live this Christian experience and trust that he's doing that. Trust that he's going to do that in your life today. Ah, this is going to be the fun part. Can you read those words for me please? Is there somebody in your life that you haven't forgiven? Don't raise your hands, please. Is there somebody in your life that you haven't forgiven? Because we're saying, God, forgive me as, while, if I forgive them. When we say to God, forgive me my trespasses, as at the same time, if I forgive those who trespass against me. Can you imagine? God says, if you confess your sins, 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of all of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That's what God does when we ask forgiveness. He wants us to be godlike with others. In the same line as that, do not judge others so that God will not judge you. For God will judge you in the same way you judge others. And he will apply to you the same rules you apply to others. Why then do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the log in your own eye? Have you ever been driving in your vehicle and you see a very filthy car in front of you? Why don't those people just wash that car? Filthy, mud, all kinds of stuff. And you get out of your car, look at your car and says, wow, <laughs> my car is just as filthy. But it's easy to see everybody else's problems and faults. So forgive, do not judge, to me, are almost synonymous. Because if I don't judge you, I can forgive you a little easier. But if I choose to hold my judgment against you, then I won't forgive you. So God says forgive in the same way that you want me to forgive you. Therefore, do not judge someone else. You never know what someone is going through. Pray for them. Help strengthen them. But be careful, cautious when we judge others. Now, I'm not saying if somebody did something wrong, 
you have the ability as a Christian and as a loved one to say, you know what you did was wrong. I prefer to say what you did is wrong or you just lied to me than to say you're a liar to me. Talk about that thing, not make that person that thing. You just stole two dollars from my dressing table. To me is much different than saying you're a thief. Because when we make such statements, it seems to make us think that we are better than, or that's what they will always be. So forgive us our trespasses. When they happen, God, forgive us. So as we do that for others as well. Lead us not into temptation. Jesus said to his disciples, keep watch and pray that you will not fall, fall, fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Lead us not. Allow us not to walk into temptation is the prayer. God, keep me so in tune with you that I will see temptation coming a mile away and go in the opposite direction. God, keep me so that I don't make a mess of my life. Paul says, do not deny yourselves to each other unless you first agree to do so for a while in order to spend your time in prayer. But resume normal marital relations. In this way you will be kept from giving in to Satan's temptations because of your lack of self-control. If you've ever done that, make sure you're doing it for the right reason. If you've ever denied being friendly with someone or spending time with someone, make sure it's for the right reason. But the part of the reason why I brought this text in is, does God tempt us? No. We say lead us not into temptation. God doesn't tempt us. It is the devil that is the tempter. Remember back in the Garden of Eden, God told Adam and Eve, stay away from that tree right there. We're told that's the only place the devil could access Adam and Eve, was at that tree of knowledge of good and evil. Did God tempt Adam and Eve with that tree? No. He made man with a free will. A free will means you need to have a choice. But he warned them, stay away from that tree right there. Don't even touch it. God knew they wouldn't die if they touched it. But how are you going to eat something if you haven't touched it? How are you going to take a hold of something? Then something will go forward. So he says, don't even touch it. Don't even get close enough to touch it. So God is not the one who tempts us. God is the one who tries to warn us. God is the one who strives to lead us not to be tempted. Who leads us in a place that we will know temptation and see it coming from a mile away. Lead us not into becoming people who will be tempted. Lead us not into a place where we will do something that is against your will, Father. Give us the strength to walk in the right way. However, but deliver us from evil. Sometimes we get ourselves in a position where we know we should not be into a situation where we know we should not be. We've done something we know we shouldn't have done. We can ask God, please deliver me from this situation right now. Give me the strength to walk out of the situation. Give me the strength to do the right thing. Deliver me from the horrible consequences of what I have done. We can ask God to do that. Now when I speak with youth on this subject, I often say to them, listen, God has said to do this and do that. God has said to wait till marriage to do this and do that. However, if you get pregnant out of wedlock, God will forgive you. He will. 
but he will not necessarily abort the baby. So although God forgives you and cleanses you, you will have a lifetime of the results of what you've done. Some of us, I'm not saying child out of wedlock, but some of us are carrying that lifetime of stuff for some of the mistakes we have made. Some of us are carrying the pain, the guilt sometimes, although God says, give it to me, give it to me. Sometimes we carry stuff that we need not because God has delivered us from evil. God has delivered us from the horrible, more horrible consequences of what we have done. So deliver us from the consequences of my stupidity, God. Deliver us from evil. Every test that you have experienced is the kind that normally comes to people. But God keeps his promise, and he will not allow you to be tested beyond your power to remain firm at the time you are put to the test. He will give you the strength to endure it and so provide you with a way out. That's what our God does. He will provide you with a way out. For thine is the kingdom. The sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the peoples of earth will weep as they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and with glory. His is the kingdom. His is the only kingdom that we need to be concerned about. Yes, there was a coronation yesterday of some guy named Charles. He is king of whatever. And some of us don't even want to bother with that. But the fact is, he's just a man. He's been given a name, some power, but nothing like the God of heaven. Nothing like the kingdom that God has and the power that God has. His power is beyond our measure. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. And they were all amazed at the mighty power of God. But while they wondered, everyone at all, everyone at all things which Jesus did, he said unto his disciples. So not only is God the creator, not only does he have the power to speak and things happen, but now he has the power to give that power to others. And through the Holy Spirit, God has given us his power. Now we're told some amazing things will happen when we have the Holy Spirit and his power, and we see what happened in the book of Acts. The book of Acts shows the power of God in man and what God will do through that. But when they saw Jesus, some saw him, some worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye, therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. That's the power our God has. And he gives us that power. He gives us that power. And the glory. We know that we give glory only to things that we believe are worthy of that glory. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. We can give him glory because of what he has done. We can give him glory because he's our creator. And as we have come to know Christ, he is our recreator. As we accept Jesus Christ in our lives, he can recreate us into greater than we ever imagined. So he's really worth and worthy of the power he has, the glory we can give him. And that will happen forever and ever. Amen. You shall not ever forget, I pray. When you pray man's prayer, 
that the Lord taught his disciples, that the words will ring through your mind. So we're not just saying it out of habit, out of custom. This is what we do. But those words will ring in your heart every moment of every day because that's who God is. That's great, how great our God is. And I love the word amen at the end of this prayer. So shall it be. That's what amen means. So shall it be. I thank God for his mercy and his grace and his love to us because he has been so willing to teach us how to pray and to let us know how his heart is as we pray. So let us pray. Our Father, we thank you so much for your loving mercy to us. We thank you how you care for us. We thank you how you have blessed us through all the craziness that our world has thrown at us. And it is only because of you that we can, can stand. It is only because of you that we can remain in your love and grace and mercy. And we thank you for that. Father, for the prayers of the people today, we do pray. We do ask that you will truly help us to trust you, that we will leave our lives in your hands, that each day we will reach forward towards you. Each day we will trust you. Each day we will know that you care and love us. Father, we ask that you bless each member of this congregation, those who are able to be in the church, those who have joined us online, that they will feel your presence each moment of each day. We pray that you'll bless those who are not in good health at this time, that you'll continue your healing hands upon them as they recoup, as they heal. We pray for those who are shut in. You know each one by name. So we'll just ask that you take all, take all of us as we give our lives to you, Help us to reach out to those who we care for and unloved. So remember Eleanor, Ralph, John, Edith. We pray that you will keep them in your care. Bless their hearts as they know you are loved. They are loved because you do love them. We pray for our nation and its leaders. We pray for the concerns that they have. We ask that you'll give us the strength and the ability to share our love for you with them so that our nation truly will be a one that is run by you. That we can say truly as we sing, God, keep this land glorious and free. So Father, we ask your blessing upon us this day and we pray that you will continue to touch our lives so that we can be your children that we can tell others of your goodness and your mercy. And in all things, we'll give you all the honor, glory, and praise. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We invite you this time to stand as we sing. Again, the words will be on the screen.
This is our Father's world, as the song used to sing, but it is God's wondrous world, and He loves us and He cares for us. So this week, go out knowing that you are cared and loved for. This week, go out sharing His goodness and His mercy. And each day as you pray, let Him know your feelings towards Him and the wants you have for the blessings of others. Now unto Him that is able to keep you from falling, to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, be all in the honor, glory, and power. Amen. Amen.